Hi everyone and welcome back to Advanced Higher Biology. Today we're continuing on with Unit 1, Cells and Proteins, and we're moving on to Key Area 3, Membrane Proteins. As with before, we're going to break up these key areas into sub-key areas. So we're going to start off with 3A, the movement of molecules across membranes. So hopefully it will start with a little bit of revision for you. The cell membrane or plasma membrane controls the entry and exit of materials in and out of the cell and it's composed of proteins and phospholipids. For advanced higher though, we're going to have to go into a little bit more detail about both the membrane proteins and the phospholipids within the cell membrane. So first of all, in terms of how they're arranged, phospholipids are uh, this sort of tadpole shape and at the top we have this hydrophilic head, meaning that the head region, which is exposed to the outside of the cell, is attracted to water. And beneath it, the tail region, is totally the opposite. It is hydrophobic, meaning it is repelled by water. And this is going to have an impact on the proteins within the cell membrane and how they interact. So in terms of these proteins, we have two different forms. We have integral proteins, which are found inside and within the membrane, and we have peripheral proteins, which as the name suggests are found on the outside. They are bound to the surface of the membrane. So we'll start off by looking at these integral proteins. So as we said, these are going to be within the cell membrane, so they interact with that hydrophobic region of the phospholipids. So these regions of hydrophobic R groups are going to allow strong hydrophobic interactions that are going to hold those integral membrane proteins within that bilayer itself. There's one other term we use to describe them, like in the diagram that you can see right here. If you have an integral protein that is across or spanning across the, the whole membrane from one end to the other, they can be termed transmembrane, meaning across the membrane. And these are going to be really useful when we look at how molecules can move from one side to the other. And in terms of these peripheral proteins, the, these are on the outside. So because these membrane proteins are on the outside of the cell membrane, they are going to have hydrophilic R groups on their surface. And they bind to the surface of these membranes mostly through ionic and hydrogen bonds. And they're shown in this diagram in the green. Now, a lot of these ones, like you may see in the bottom right of this diagram, are actually going to interact with the surface of integral membrane proteins. So just if you have to try and identify one in a diagram, don't be confused if they look like they're latched on to the end of an integral protein. That still happens, they're still on the outside, and they're still a peripheral protein. Now, the cell membrane itself, like we've said, this is going to be a barrier to ions and uncharged polar molecules. As we've maybe mentioned before in natural 5 and higher, some small molecules, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, can simply just diffuse through the cell membrane. They can pass through without much trouble. However, a lot of other molecules are going to have to go through slightly more different processes to cross from one side of the cell membrane to the other. So because of this, we have something called facilitated diffusion. So facilitated diffusion is still a passive or a non-use of energy mode of transport across the membrane, but they're going to use specific transmembrane proteins that are there for a certain job. And there's two different types of these. There are channel proteins and there are transporter proteins. So both of these are going to allow the facilitated diffusion of molecules from one end to the other of the cell membrane. So first of all, for these channel proteins, these are multi-subunit proteins with subunits arranged to form water-filled pores that extend across the membrane. That all sounds quite complicated. Really all it means is these are transmembrane proteins that have a pore, so they have this channel or almost like a tunnel running from one end to the other that molecules can go through to cross from one side of the membrane to the other. Now, as we said though, in diffusion, not all molecules can do this. So these channel proteins are very highly selective, meaning that only some types of molecules can pass through them. Not all molecules can just travel through that channel. To prevent any molecule from just going through that channel or working through that tunnel to get from one side to the other, many of these are gated. And gated, as the name suggests, just means there's a gate across this channel protein and there's going to be a change in shape that's going to either close the gate to prevent diffusion or open the gate to allow a molecule to diffuse across. 
So as always, we have another subcategory here in terms of our gated channel proteins. So there's two types of gates that you can come across and you need to be able to recognize each one by how they work. So there are ligand gated channels, which are controlled by the binding of signal molecules, which means that a specific signal molecule is going to bind to a ligand gated channel. The ligand gated end is going to open up and the molecule can now diffuse through. The other type though is voltage gated, and this isn't controlled by signal molecules, this is instead controlled by changes in ion concentration. I'll go into a bit more detail about that in the next sub-key area. And in terms of these transported proteins, they do exactly as the name suggests. What they do is they're going to transport whatever substance needs to be moved from one side of the cell membrane to the other, and they as well are going to go through a conformational change, so a change in shape to transfer that solute across the membrane. So, for example, you can see in the diagram here in the sort of middle to right, you have these transporter proteins that at one stage will be opened up to allow a solute to bind, and it's then going to go through that change in shape that's going to allow that molecule to get transported across. The protein will open up with this change in conformation, and the solute is then going to be released to the other side. And that then might work the other way around as well. So these transporters alternate between two different conformations that are going to allow binding and then being exposed on the other side to release that solute as well. And finally, we're going to quickly look at pump proteins. So pump proteins you'll came across in higher biology, and these, you may remember, use active transport. So now if you use active transport, then you're going to be using energy, you're moving molecules up a concentration gradient from a lower concentration to a higher concentration of the molecule that you're moving. So these pump proteins are going to transfer these substances across the cell membrane, but they require a source of metabolic energy. And in able to get this energy, some of these active transport pump proteins will hydrolyze ATP directly in order to provide energy to change conformation and to pump these molecules from one end to the other. And th these uh, molecules will use enzymes called ATPases that are simply there to hydrolyze ATP to provide that source of energy for the pump protein to work. So ATPases, quite an easy one to remember. If it ends in A's, it's an enzyme really. And ATPases hydrolyze ATP to provide that energy. Now this will be a lot more useful in your next subcarrier where we'll go on to 3B where we'll look at ion transport pumps and the generation of ion gradients. So we'll go into a little bit more detail and we'll take a look at the sodium potassium pump, which is quite a big case study in terms of this transport across the membrane. That's all for 3A. I'll see you for the next video. Thanks so much for everyone who has been watching and thanks again for any comments you can find my way as well. Really glad to find you can find these useful. Okay, that's all for 3A. I'll see you again for the next video. Bye for now.